Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and we are on my show, Author to Author. And tonight, I'm talking with my friend Peter Breen, and he's written a very interesting book with quite a long title, Prodigal Pilgrim, Letters to Pope Francis from Lourdes, Fatima, Garabandal, and Medjugorje. Um, I'm sure that you'll enjoy this interview. It has a lot of interesting points about our current Pope and his thoughts. And how are you tonight, Peter? Oh, hello, Cynthia. I'm um, very well, thank you. And thank you very Good. much for speaking with me and for being interested in my book, which has only just been published here in Australia. And it's uh, just been published also by Father Mahud in, um, Mother, Father Mahud, Mahud obviously, Doctor. In, um, <laughs> in Ohio. So thank you. Okay. Um, would you like to start us with a prayer? Yes, Lord, um, have mercy on us. Grant us the insight and the understanding of your will for us and for our world, uh, for our destiny and for all the hopes and aspirations of our children who seem to have so many things hanging over their head that we, in our youth, uh, were able to avoid. So be kind and be good, dear Lord, and look after us. Amen. Amen. So this is uh, very timely, um, a very timely uh, book to be talking about. Um, you know, Francis is certainly has many who uh, love him and um, some who do not necessarily understand him. Um, so what was it that led you to write the book? Well, um, in, in exactly that context, um, the Holy Father at one of his Angelus prayer meetings, said that he would like to hear from the faithful and hear their point of view about how the church operates in the modern world. And, you know, the modern world that I live in and operate in uh, is very secular and in many ways totally unrelated to the way the church operates. So I, I thought, well, now this is a good opportunity for me to write to the Holy Father and tell him what I think. Um, not that it might count for very much in his worldview, but I thought, well, if he wants feedback, here it is. And, mm -hmm. and then, oddly enough, uh, of course, the latest synod came along uh, in which we're all being invited to contribute to the ideas and to the deliberations of the bishops in all the countries. Uh, and so here I am uh, speaking with you, Cynthia, and mm -hmm. having my book launch uh, all at the same time as the World Synod of Bishops is considering the idea of, I think it's pronounced synodality. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it is pronounced. <laughs> yes, it's a hard word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so it's good that um, someone is taking up the, uh, you know, the issues that he's been addressing um, and wants the input of the lay faithful. Um, I think that's uh, a very important point. Yes, look, when I first looked at uh, the idea of making a contribution um, in the form of this book, um, I was struck by something that uh, the former Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, said, and that is that, um, that there's a, a growing divide between religion and reason and, you know, be, again, between the church and the secular world. Mm -hmm. And he thought that unless God reappeared in some convincing fashion, uh, that the world and mankind uh, were, in his words, doomed to failure. And, um, you know, that was in his book, uh, Truth and Tolerance, which was mm -hmm. uh, published by Ignatius Press. And, uh, you know, that really surprised me that he, that he would have such... Uh, on the face of it, such a dim view of our prospects. But, you know, when you look at the um, uh, predictions of people who, who have some concern about the state of the natural environment, uh, mm -hmm. then it seems to me that there is a parallel between um, both Pope Francis and Benedict uh, and also the uh, people who support the idea of global warming and the destruction impending for the natural environment, that the church and the world really are on the same trajectory. And uh, as Benedict says, unless God reappears in some convincing fashion, then we're all facing a huge, the huge prospect of there being 
of, of what David Attenborough says, you know, of the world becoming worse rather than better. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're just sort of holding our breath, you know. There, there has to be something that happens that changes the way the secular world thinks uh, and, and at the same time aligns the church more closely with the secular world because, you know, we're on different paths at the moment and the destiny of the planet and, and the earth uh, is the same for all of us. So we all have to somehow get on the same page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, that, is the, that is really a very important point. Um, because although even in the secular world, there are many who realize that something has to be done. Um, you know, that they're concerned about the overall environment, about global warming, whatever. Um, but there doesn't seem to be, to me, uh, any unification of these people together, you know, getting together um, and addressing these issues um, in a... Uh, in a long-term format. I mean, certainly there's conferences, there's um, discussions, but it's nothing that's, to me, on a day-to-day -day basis at any high level. Look, I think that's true. I think that's true in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think it's true elsewhere in the world. Really? Um, even in Australia, for example, you know, during this week, there was a decision to close the biggest coal uh, power, coal power generation facility in Australia. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's a remarkable thing. It provided 20% of their electricity in New South Wales. And so, um, and it was, you know, done without any consultation with government, but by the corporate people that run the power generation. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, in other states of Australia and in other countries, uh, you know, including Canada um, and mm -hmm. in the countries of Europe, uh, mm -hmm. There is a recognition that, that, we all, that we all have to do something. And Australia, mm -hmm. for the first time, our government has made the decision to, uh, to have net zero emissions by 2050, uh, which is uh, something they took to the Glas Glasgow Climate Conference. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was a, an astounding development in a country which is run by a conservative government. For the conservative yeah. government to make that decision mm -hmm. uh, was a huge sort of change in direction and recognition of the fact that we all have this impending problem uh, mm -hmm. and we have to address it now. We can't just wait for the, you know, for the events to overtake us. We have to act and um, be on the front foot. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to change it. It'll just be, um, it'll, it'll go, what, go beyond what they are calling this, these mm -hmm. tipping points. So mm -hmm. it's very, it's very, I'm very pleased to see it happening. But it's not so obvious in the U.S. I mean, there's such no. division in the U.S., you know, between, you know, between left and right, if you like, or, or between conservative and progressive politics, mm -hmm. um, and even between religious and non-religious people. I was yeah. reading just the other day and quoted this statistic in my book that the Pew Research Centre uh, says mm -hmm. that, that we are about, in the, in the United States, that 50% the, that of the people... Uh, are about to become disbelievers in the God of the uh, Jewish and Christian Bible. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's a remarkable change to be happening happening in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and I was surprised to think that because, you know, it's not that long ago that 60 or 70% of people in uh, America had, you know, a Christian background, they had a Christian identity, and mm -hmm. their aspirations were largely aligned with the Christian churches. But, uh, you know, that's just, that's just not happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if less than 50% of the people believe in the traditional Christian values, then that's a, that's, that's a remarkable change in the way that the people of America operate because, uh, you know, there has to be this common agreement, whether it's about Christianity or whether it's about some other ethos. You know, the morality of the world depends on the morality of the United States because the United States is effectively the leader of the free world. So, you know, we are looking to America to get on the front foot. And, you know, from my, from my point of view, Joe Biden has done that very well and very dramatically. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like Pope Francis, he's the subject of terrible criticism and, oh, yeah. Yeah. and condemnation for, um, mm -hmm. you know, for the way he talks, you know, for the for the way he appears, for his age, you know, these are all yeah. 
old, outdated prejudices that you don't use to judge people by. But, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's what's happening, and it's happening in the church as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, when you look at, um, as an American, um, I can tell you that there are enormous amounts of prejudice here against various groups, and certainly... Um, although many people would probably disagree me, agree with me. As an older woman, I can tell you that there is plenty of ageism and sexism here. It is alive and well. Not, and I'm not saying in the church. I'm saying in the country. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so we all say, oh, no, we don't have that. <laughs> We're not like that at all. But, yeah, we are. And yeah. um, you can see that when you look at how people are reacting to Biden. If they don't like his politics, I've had people who don't like his politics say to me, half of the time he doesn't even know where he is. Now, <laughs> don't know how you can say that with a straight face. You know? <laughs> right. They have remarkable insight. They have remarkable insight, these people. They can see into his head and see how he's thinking. Like, how do they yeah. do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, but it's, <laughs> but it's like, to me, it's, it is disrespectful. Um, even if you don't like the man, he is the president. Yeah. Um, but it concerns me because um, it does say something about our approach to the world. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of glad to hear that in other places, um, these environmental factors are being taken into account in much yes. more so than here. Most yes, well, people here don't think that. Yes, um, I, anyway. I think I think it's fair to say that in general, people that supported Biden, which you know was um, uh, an overwhelming majority of the American population in terms mm -hmm. of of um, the popular vote, supported mm -hmm. Biden. I think he won by seven million votes. So the American people generally, I think, support him. Um, I think it's fair also to say that a lot of them are disappointed in the way that his presidency has begun. Um, and whether they expected more or whether they expected greater support from the pub Republicans, it's hard to know. But yes. um, I, I'm, yeah. I'm certainly personally very sorry that the Americans are so disappointed because, you know, Biden to me is a, is a, a, a devout Catholic and a, a person mm. with uh, great moral values. That He's a man um, of integrity, I think. You, you can only admire and respect the man and um, to see him denigrated in the same way that you see Pope Francis denigrated uh, mm -hmm. is very upsetting and, and um, you know, not healthy either for our democracy mm -hmm. or for our church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. There's nothing I, that you've said that I can disagree with. Um, I do think that uh, the problem is not just that there are those who don't like Biden. It's that there's... Um, such a division here, especially starting with the uh, attack on the Capitol, as to whether it was justified or not, that um, it's hard for people to get past that and see what Biden could do, which he really, I don't think, is being as effective as he could be. But, uh, but I do think that that's where the issue lies. That was a that was a page turner in our history. And many people will tell you that it was, you know, patriots acting to save the country. And they believe it. Yes. So. Yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit like what's happening uh, in Canada, you know, with those blockages of, um, of the border. And, oh, the uh, trucks, yeah. Yeah, and similar things are happening in Australia. You know, they're blocking Capitol Hill and Parliament with trucks and protesters and Mm -hmm. People advocating freedom and um, and denigrating lockdown, um, and it's just a level of discontent that seems to be out of proportion to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I don't know whether any any anything could be greater as problems go than exist than our very existence, which is what we're talking about with the natural environment. Yeah, um, and yet we're sort of fluffing around these other issues. Mm -hmm. As if they're somehow more important, and uh, mm -hmm. and really, we have, you know we're we're in such a, such a difficult state with the environment that, to my mind, everything else just pales to insignificance. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that people have kind of like put them all together into this yeah. horrible sense of unhappiness or wanting to change things yeah. back to something that they can't be anymore. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And and you know, there's also the issue of um, uh, of rich and poor, which is becoming you know quite ridiculous. You know, of the 7.7 billion people in the world, 50% of them uh, live on less than five dollars a day, whereas the you know 50% of the wealth in the world is controlled by eight people. I mean, this kind of disproportion. Uh, mm -hmm. generates discontent you know um, if there's no equity in the distribution of wealth and resources mm -hmm. uh, that there's no justice for the poor and uh, you know without justice for the poor as Pope Francis often says um, you know the world is headed for destruction because uh, you know the poor can't change the way they live whereas the rich can and the rich aren't prepared to for whatever reason um, and, you know, for good reasons, uh, they argue that, uh, you know, they've worked hard, they've earned their money, uh, they deserve the rewards of their, of their efforts. Um, but, you know, existentialism is a bigger problem for the rich than the poor because only the rich can solve it. And yet um, the various measures that we have, not just our taxation system, but just the very way that our capitalist markets work uh, means that the poor are always going to be part of the system because, the you know, poverty is actually built into the capitalist system. And so we have to address those very difficult economic issues at the same time as we address the environmental issues because we can't possibly allow growth at the kind of level that economists would like us to see uh, without creating further pressure and further destruction on the environment. So, you know, we are in a serious bind where we have to find some way to redistribute our resources at the same time as protecting our environment, because otherwise, um, you know, as David Attenborough says, things can only get worse for planet Earth. They can't get better. So, you know, mm -hmm. you have to respect someone like David Attenborough's observations about the natural environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad, I'm glad of your interest in my book because, um, you know, um, Pope Benedict uh, said that he his idea about... Um, of, of mankind and the world coming together and getting on the same page uh, was for God to reappear in some convincing fashion. I was very surprised to hear Pope Benedict say something so dramatic. I don't mm -hmm. think he was talking. I don't think he was talking about the second coming or no. um, the apocalypse or any of these things that so, sometimes we think about and think about in a kind of apocalyptic and life-threatening way. I think he was talking about um, you know some some simple change in the way we think, in the way we operate. And uh, to my mind, you know, that lines up consistently with uh, what's been happening in Our Lady's apparitions. That, uh, you know, Lords, Fatima, um, Garabandal, I'm not so certain about, um, but certainly Majigorio, for example, um, you know, the, the, the promises and the so-called secrets that have emanated from Our Lady's apparitions uh, mm -hmm. all suggest some kind of uh, enlightenment, some kind of uh, intervention by the Holy Spirit to allow the world to kind of reset the way we think and, and reset the way we operate. Uh, and that's the kind of intervention that I think Benedict had in mind when he suggested that the world, uh, that religion generally and, um, and the world need to somehow get on the same page. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no question that the reset in thinking has to occur first. Yeah, you know, the, be, the behavior be the behavior can't be changed without without our changing of an attitude, and I personally can't see that happening. I hope it does, but yeah, um, yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I felt this. I felt the same um, mm -hmm. until I be became interested in uh, the apparitions at Majigorie, and uh, mm -hmm. I travelled there uh, initially back in 1991, uh, which was 10 years. It had been going 10 years at that point. Yeah. Uh, and now it's been going for 40 years, which is quite extraordinary, really. Yes, it uh, is. That, that the same message, um, the same predictions, the same prophecies um, have been given to us through six uh, originally children, now adults, of course, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, but people in the secular world, you know. In the past at Lourdes and Fatima, um, the children who were the witnesses to Our Lady's apparitions 
uh, went on to become nuns and brothers and priests. Uh, mm -hmm. well, well, sorry, nuns. Um, mm -hmm. There were no males that survived long enough. Um, but at, at Mudjugorje, there are six young people uh, who are now in their 50s mm -hmm. uh, who have children of their own. They live in Mudjugorje. They're all married. Uh, they're all on the same prophetic page that they've been on for 40 years. Uh, there's never been any conflict between them, in, either in the message or their interpretation of it or in their transmission to us of what they witness and what's happening to them. And, for, you know, for that to continue for such a long time yeah. uh, is truly remarkable. Um, you can't imagine any other phenomenon that wasn't somehow guided by the Holy Spirit uh, mm -hmm. being able to last that long. Certainly a fraud wouldn't last that long. No. Uh, certainly some kind of delusion uh, that engaged so many people couldn't possibly last for that long. Uh, so I think, you know, to answer your question about you can't see it happening, um, it may be that it, it happens without us, you know, without us having any comprehension until perhaps the last minute when suddenly, it, you know, the penny drops for everyone. Well, this is what we need to do. And it, mm -hmm. it could come through um, Majigoria's uh, prophecies. Um, it, it may also include some aspects that are, that are disastrous for us in many ways. Um, but, you know, really, we're facing disaster anyway. If we continue down the path that we're going with the uh, climate crisis that we have and the fact that, you know, we now build more stuff that, than, the, than there is biomass on the planet. You know, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Build environment. And the things we make are now, now outweighs the natural plants and animals that mm -hmm. make up our environment. Um, mm -hmm. you know, 90, something like 98% of mammals on the earth are now human beings and their livestock. You know, I mean, we've just changed the way the world operates. And, you know, nature in some form is going to fight back because, um, you know, the planet will still be here in whatever form. Um, and it's up to us to be the custodians and, uh, you know, we're, we're just not doing a good job and uh, I think we just have to have this, you know, reset in order for us to survive, you know. We're talking existentialism here, but a lot of people won't address that, you know. Oh, no, look, this is something else is more important, you know. Um, but, you know, those two problems of um, the natural environment and limited resources and poverty. I mean, those two things are so dramatically important mm -hmm. uh, that, that they're the whole focus of Pope Francis's ministry. And, mm -hmm. you know, for those who reject those propositions, then it, it's not surprising that they would also reject Pope Francis's ministry because, you know, yeah. Laudato Si was, uh, was his landmark encyclical about the natural environment um, and every speech he gives, every sermon he gives, every uh, dialogue that he engages in uh, involves protecting the poor. And, uh, you know, he grew up with the poor, he understands the poor, and he recognises more than anyone that, you know, the poor can only change with mercy and with the benefit of uh, grace and uh, a different mindset for the wealthy. Mm. I'm glad I'm not rich. I don't have so much responsibility. <laughs> the, rich have, the rich have a great responsibility to change okay. because only the rich can afford to make the necessary adjustments to the way we live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't ask someone living in poverty to change the way they live without helping them. Without, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this idea that you often hear that God will save us, you know, well, God will save us, but um, He will only save us if we help to save each other because, uh, yeah. you know, there are plenty of resources to go around, but to have them all concentrated in the hands of such a few um, is so unjust and, and so, you know, ultimately in inequitable that, um, you know, we are truly the masters of our own destiny until we can find some way to solve that problem. Yeah. Well, I was born in the poor. Um, in the lower, lower class, or what we would call here the underclass. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was one of the people that made it out of there. Um, the majority do not, and that underclass is certainly growing in this country. I don't know about in the rest of the world. Um, 
you know, and the easy things that we could do uh, to help people apart from giving them aid, money. Yes. The biggest thing to me is um, on a secular issue, not a religious issue, is education. And, yes. you know, without education, people are absolutely doomed. And, you know, I think so often of, um, you know, I, uh, I actually was going to fail out of first grade. <laughs> That's so embarrassing because I couldn't read. And yeah. the principal came to my mother, who did know how to read, and uh, he told her, if you don't teach her how to read over the summer, she's going to stay back. And so... Um, one of the few good things that I can say is that my mother did teach me how to read and it opened up the world for me in a way that you can't get any other way. You can't watch it on TV. You can't get it in the movie. You have to be able to study things and analyze things. And um, so to me, even something as simple, as simple as helping people learn how to read and learn how to think not a long political or any, any type of idea like that, but just to be able to look at something and see, analyze it, see if it's, it's worth looking at, so if, it's, if the argument is good, if the evidence is good. So, um, you know, that isn't something that would cost uh, people much, but we don't even have that here. I've been a teacher for years, um, professor, and I've had students born here um, that really wanted to learn and just couldn't read, couldn't understand. And it's like that's, that to me is, you know, if we did something as simple as that so people could judge what's going on in the world, um, I think it would be such an aid. Because now people are just driven by what they hear. Somebody that's intelligent tells them, well, this is good, this is bad, and they believe them because that person is intelligent and has money. Yeah. Yes, I mean, we, we, have, um, we, we don't have such a problem in Australia. We have a, we have a very good education system in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, um, you know, most of, most of the private schools are Christian schools, mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, the, the way the system works is that there's a fair distribution of resources. So, mm. uh, you know, all the, with the exception perhaps of some outback communities, uh, there are equal opportunities in Australia for education. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was growing up, uh, it was just after the war and uh, my family, uh, my father was a, an ex-serviceman and um, there were, there were allocations of, housing allotments for people mm -hmm. who were ex-service, the families of ex-servicemen. Um, and, you know, we all had um, equal opportunity for housing. And, you know, that, that like education, is mm -hmm. extremely important. You know, yes. if, you, if, you're, if you're living in your car or mm -hmm. you're living under a bridge, yeah. uh, then all the opportunities for education don't mean anything. Yeah. So, you know, we have to address... Um, multiple social problems. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, food, food, health care, education, yeah. housing, um, yeah. equal access to jobs. I mean, certainly the words are there, uh, I think, in most countries, but the meaning of those words are not the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's not a popular idea, but, but we do have to have um, more social aspects to our government policies. Yes. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, we've been so successful at, at capitalism mm -hmm. uh, that we've kind of outsmarted ourselves on some level mm -hmm. because the system now can't operate. You know, we, we would need three or four Earths to sustain the kind of uh, living that people like you and I have, you know, where we have enough to eat and we have proper housing mm -hmm. and we're educated, you know, to, mm -hmm. to have that for 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, we would need the resources of three or four planets. And so, you know, we just have this huge disparity between mm -hmm. rich and 
form, which, which, you know, on our level, on our human level, is, is actually insurmountable. Um, and that's why um, we need for God to intervene and to mm -hmm. um, somehow help us resolve this apparently impossible existential difficulty that we're facing. And uh, without that, things, as Attenborough says, can only get worse. Um, and, uh, you know, more and more, uh, I, think you, I think we will find that, um, that there'll be governments elected who, because more people are affected, governments will, like, like the Biden administration will be elected who have policies to address social problems, you know, health, mm -hmm. health problems. Mm -hmm. Welfare problems, um, housing, education, you know, these are the key issues. <clears throat> I, had, um, I had some experience when I was younger of, uh, of being a representative in one of the, one of the parliaments in Australia. And, uh, you know, the thing that always struck me was that, that governments, um, you know, of whatever persuasion, were always influenced by major corporations and in Australia, major mining companies um, in a way that was totally disproportionate to the resources that governments had at their disposal. So that governments would fund um, mining projects with incentives that really should have been directed towards education and to housing. And so that's been happening for, you know, ever since the industrial Re revolution. So, you know, we have to now correct that imbalance and somehow get back to recognising that, you know, without support for the people, uh, for our populations, um, you know, all the successful mining operations and corporate activities in the world are meaningless because uh, without people, they don't, they just don't work. And, you know, people are now in America, especially where, where the basic wages and basic remuneration is so low that, you know, people can't really afford not to work, but on the other hand, because of such low wages, they actually can't afford to work either. So they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Um, I hate to sound like a socialist because I'm not actually a socialist at all. Well, neither uh, am I. <laughs> but, but, but there I are, do, yeah, I there do are problems. I yeah. do recognise that we can't go on the way we're going because, uh, yeah. You know, the system just hasn't worked. Well, it has worked. It's worked too well, but it's, uh, it can't continue to work in the same form that mm -hmm. we've been used to. And uh, how we make this change is just actually beyond me. Mm -hmm. I'm, glad, I'm glad there's a God to rely on to help us. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly it's worked, but it's worked much better for some than for others. Yes. Um, and there's, and the, those that are you know, that it doesn't work for are definitely in the majority and pretty much worldwide. Yeah, yeah. Look at the, the figure I gave you earlier is astounding that, you know, eight individuals control half the world's wealth. Like, that is astounding. <laughs> and I think three of them, are, I think three of them are Americans. <laughs> oh, dear. And, but, yeah, you know, it's... And, yeah. and they, want to travel, they want to travel to Mars, you know, and they, if, if, if the cost of traveling to Mars could be redirected into um, the problems of, of Earth surviving, that, that seems to me that would be a much better thing to do with your money. But, you know, those eight individuals seem to have such priorities that, um, that they're unrelated to what are really the fundamental problems facing the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like traveling to Mars, you know, who cares what's on Mars? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I feel. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, my husband said something along the same line. We were watching um, some of these, what was it? You could buy a ticket and if you were rich and you'd go up in the spaceship for a few minutes and all that money that could have yeah, been yeah. done for good. I mean, I understand the need for exploration. I mean, we wouldn't be here in the United States if someone hadn't decided to build a boat. But yeah. um but it's out of proportion because the need is so great. Yeah. And also, also the idea of, um, of space travel um, is so ridiculous that the mind boggles, you know. When you think of the size of the universe, mm -hmm. um, we thought it was big with, when we had the James Hubble satellite. Yeah. Now we've got the, uh, the Webb satellite, which is just, 
you know, it's just demonstrating the size of the universe is beyond all conception. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that we might somehow travel out there um, with, with the limited knowledge that we have of nature and how, how it works um, is just too silly for words, really, especially when, you know, when we're facing the existential threat of our own survival. Why would we waste our resources on, on something as big as the universe? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I do understand the attraction uh, of, you know, of the universe, um, yeah. apart from looking up at the stars at night and saying, wow, it's really pretty. <laughs> um, you know, I, <clears throat> you know how sometimes you just have a, a really spiritual moment. And uh, I think it was not last Christmas, the Christmas before, it was the um, news that the, when the wise men saw the star of Bethlehem, it, they thought it might have been Saturn and Jupiter, you know, their light blending. I wanted to see that so much. Every night I looked up in the sky. And the oh, really? night that it, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, the night that it really happened here where I live in Vermont, it was all cloudy. And we were out. My husband and I were out and we got home. It was dark, obviously. I got out of the car. The clouds parted. I don't think it might have been for 10 seconds, but I saw it. And to me, that was like, but I don't know if it's true, but just the thought that I might have seen the same thing that the kings saw or the wise men saw on the other side of the planet 2,000 years ago. Just, I mean, it, it practically brought me to tears. It yeah, was yeah. Such, such an intense experience for me. So I can understand people looking up and wanting to know because that's what humans do. We want to know. But, again, it's way out of proportion. You know, you can't, you can't want to know when it's going to cost people their lives, you know, uh, the ability of the planet to do what it's supposed to do. Or, yeah. You know, it, it's way out of proportion. Yeah, but yeah, I, understand, yeah. I understand the attraction. Yes, it's interesting. If, if, you, if you saw the same light that the... Um that the Magi saw 2,000 years ago, um, of course, it's 2,000 years time travel further away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Given, that's true. Given, given the universe is expanding, mm -hmm. which, is, which is truly amazing, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. they, thought that, they thought that the expansion had stopped and that it, that it was all beginning to contract. To collapse, yeah. It's, it's still it's going not. out. Yeah. No. And there's no well, resistance in space for it to stop. It, that's true, but within our own galaxy, I mean, if you're looking at Jupiter and Saturn, um, they're light combining. It's not like the planets are like side by side, but yeah. um, that is, it's conceivable because even though the galaxy, I'm sure, you know, has changed over 2,000 years, um, it wasn't like it was two different stars. They call it the Star of Bethlehem, but they actually think it was the light from those two. Yeah. So by, by the time the light reaches the Earth, of course, it, it's left its point of origin mm -hmm. millions, or sometimes billions of years ago, mm -hmm. traveling at eighty, tra traveling at one hundred eighty-six thousand miles per second. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's how fast. Big is, <laughs> how, big, how big is the universe? Yeah, it's humongous. It's humongous. But yeah, well, I mean, it's it, God made this, and I mean, if anything, it shows us how incredibly powerful He is. I mean, can you yeah, imagine? Look, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. I've been struggling with that myself because, uh, you know, what's happening for me is that um, the more I see of the size of the universe and, and our kind of inconspicuous place that, you know, in a backwater of the Milky Way galaxy, um, you know, what, what purpose is there in having such a vast universe? And... How, how does that become further evidence that it's created by God? You know, to my mind, um, you know, when I look at other possibilities um, and, and in, the, in the light of the c complexities of nature, not just at, at the um, cosmic level, but at the subatomic level as well, um, you know, 
given given the nature of life and the complexities involved and mm -hmm. the size of the universe, it kind of all doesn't necessarily mean that there's a God, you know, to my mind. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of raises the possibility of chance to a much greater degree, given the things that we're learning in science mm -hmm. than existed previously. You know, when the world was small and it was just the universe was what we could see and, the, and, the, mm -hmm. and heaven was just above the clouds, yeah. um, you know, that was easier to understand. But mm -hmm. given the complexities we now know, um, it may be, and it's more likely in mathematical terms, uh, that it's happened by chance. And so that's another problem mm -hmm. for that's, people that's... In, the modern, in the modern world. Yeah. Have to deal with. yeah you know? that's, that's very interesting because when I, um, I mean, there's two thoughts that come to my mind. Uh, and the first, which I'm not being sarcastic, but God is really smart, <laughs> you know, so there's no reason. I mean, he's really, really smart. Uh, so obviously he could do this. And if chance is involved, there's nothing in the universe that God hasn't created. And that can include chance. So he may have, I mean, he's not not like random chance, but chance that we don't understand the rules of. To us, it looks like it's not planned or something. Yeah. But, you know, I firmly believe, um, you know, over here on this little planet Earth in Vermont, um, I just, uh, I do believe that everything from the cells or the little pieces of, that make up the cells of our bodies and all the way up to the massive universe, even if it's a multiverse, who knows? It's created by him. And he knew what he was doing. He put laws in it, and chance may be one of them. You know, so, no, you know, if it's there, he had to make it. Yeah, but, but his, his job, the, the more we learn in science, his job becomes more and more difficult, given oh, yeah. the size. Like the size is the thing that blows me away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the size, not, you know, as I said, not just at the uh, cosmic level, but the subatomic level as well. Yeah. I mean, oh, I know. It's fascinating. It's but a, it's see, every time, you, every time you can look at something like that, what you're really looking, I mean, we didn't even know about cells, I don't know, 100 years ago or 200 years. I don't know the, the time, yeah. but we didn't know about cells. We didn't know about the parts of cells. Every time we discover something, we're discovering something God made. And yes. the appropriate, for me, the appropriate response to that is awe. I mean, whether it's teeny, teeny, tiny to the whole shebang, you know, so. Yeah, the, um, what, one of the other aspects of, um, of nature, of course, is this issue of dark matter. And there's a, mm -hmm. question, a question in mathematics that can't be answered without something like dark matter. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people are saying, well, look, this dark matter is a figment of some scientist's imagination. And... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, really, it should be just dismissed out of hand, and we just should keep looking for what it is that balances all the mathematics of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps the James Webb uh, satellite will reveal stuff from the outer reaches of the universe that can change the way we think about the mathematics. But, uh, you know, the complexity of it uh, means that the chances of there being some other planet, some other species... Uh, some other form of life in what we've been calling the Goldilocks zone mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. just in increases exponentially when you think sure. about the size of the universe. So yeah. it, to my mind, it's less likely that we're alone in the universe as um, mm -hmm. Arthur C. Clarke's, Arthur C. Clarke used to say, <laughs> either we're alone in the universe or we're not. And either proposition is mind boggling. And it's more true. That's even more likely uh, to have an impact on you the more mm -hmm. we learn about the universe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I personally just can't wait to see what the James Webb satellite reveals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, you froze. You've, and the yeah. fact that 
the oh, there gas has been able to earth is, is just amazing, really. Um, and the kind of potential, the, the potential of human uh, development and resources and understanding uh, is kind of unlimited in a way, um, but we just need more information. And uh, I don't know where it's going to come from. And if we're going to change direction and have a reset in the way we think about the world, uh, then we are going to need some kind of revelation. And, um, you know, this idea of, uh, God intervening in human history um, is not without precedent, of course. The, the prophet Abraham and the prophets of the Old Testament all had the benefit of a direct line of communication with God. You know, we mm -hmm. don't have that in our generation, uh, or not, not apparently. Uh, mm -hmm. We could have it through, through Mary and her apparitions, mm -hmm. um, but, but, but again, uh, it's uncertain. Um, whereas there was no uncertainty in Abraham and the prophets in what they were told and the direction in which they had to go. Um, and we somehow need to have the benefit of that same direction and um, intervention, um, mm -hmm. militant in intervention, as um, a guy called, uh, or sort of some, some um, theologians call it. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a, proposition um, put forward by a number of Protestant theologians about divine intervention being militant. Um, I mentioned it in my book. Uh, it's an idea that, uh, uh, that, that was new to me, but, um, you know, if God's going to intervene, then it's such an outrageous proposition when you think about it, um, that it would have to be on such a scale and so apparent that it would be unbelievable, that it would be totally believable. So um, how that might happen in our understanding of theology and the way God operates um, mm -hmm. is, is also very interesting, and it's as interesting as the size of the universe. Um, but, of course, for those people that don't believe in God, then it's, uh, you know, to my mind, it's something that they're missing out on because uh, none yeah. of this stuff can happen, to my mind, and like, like you, I believe, Mm -hmm. um, it can't happen without God's plan being uh, revealed to us. And uh, how it might be revealed is uh, a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in his maybe time, we, he'll do it. Maybe the, uh, <laughs> maybe, the, maybe the James Webb satellite will find God out there somewhere and we'll get a big picture. And then we go, oh, beauty, there it is. Problem solved. <laughs> no, 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 but no, he'll do it in his own time. He actually intervenes in our personal lives all the time. You know, it's, yeah. he in, you know, it's, I, you know, I think he probably intervenes. We just don't know it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. No, look, um, my wife totally disbelieves that proposition. Really? She's in, the, she's in the next room and shakes her head every time I suggest that God would intervene in our lives. And... It's very interesting um, living with someone who, who believes that God is, she, she doesn't not believe in God, but she believes that God is out there somewhere, um, but has less, you know, less or more important things to worry about than our humble lives. And we have to do it all ourselves. Um, but like you, I'm inclined to think that, um, that God is not silent, uh, mm. that God is an intervening oh. God. But... <laughs> But the kind of intervention that we're talking about for the world to recognise the problems that it's got and how to get how to solve them, um, you know, needs some overt behaviour on the part of God that we're really not accustomed to, not since the time of Abraham and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Well, you never know what he has up his sleeves. No, no. <laughs> but, but the other part of it is he could intervene just by you know, somebody raising up somebody who is able to become a great leader. We've seen that before, in, yes. especially in biblical times, a great leader that can really alter things. Yeah, yeah. You know, so. And it needs to be, uh, it needs to be done democratically and not under a dictatorship, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Um, of course. Uh, I'd rather be, I'd rather, I'd rather, if we're going to go to hell in a handbasket, I'd rather do it as a democracy than a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the majority of the, if the majority of the people want us to go to hell in a handbasket, then I'm on board. Count me in. <laughs>
But if some dictator who, who represents <laughs> a very small group of the population says we're all going to hell in a handbasket, I want to fight them. <laughs> and that, I think that's the difference between the Western democracies that we understand and the way that they operate in um, communist countries such as Russia and China. Yeah. You know, they seem to they seem to be okay with their leaders making all the decisions, but mm-hmm. you know their deci- their decisions number one are atheistic, and number two, uh, yeah. they're not necessarily in the best interests of the people; they're only mm-hmm. in the interests of the dictators. So, right, I think I'd rather I'd rather be stuck in our system than their system. Mm-hmm. I understand. So I, I was I was saying earlier that um, that. That because I was in Parliament, I got to see firsthand how governments work, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, even the best of democracies are influenced by those with the most muscle and the most mm-hmm. uh, the most money. I suppose it comes down to. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we need to make our, our de- democracies uh, more accountable and more representative of the people. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, democracy shouldn't be representative of the interests of big business and. The interests no. of people that don't care about the direction in which the climate's going and the planet's going. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, unless we can put a conscience into those people that that, that determine those things, then um, government needs to be more influenced by the majority of the people. I mean, that that is a democracy, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, all in good time. I do. You know, I, I um, I'm a hopeful person. I do believe God is in charge, and I hope you're I, right. Hmm? I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. I don't, like, I don't like the idea of people like me being in charge. That's appalling. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, God is in charge, and just because we don't know what's going to happen or how he's going to do something or who he'll raise up or what will happen doesn't mean he's not in charge. And, um, you know, that gives me, uh, I have a strong faith there. You know, I don't understand why a lot of things happen. I don't understand things that have happened in my life that have been bad and the life of people I know. But in the end, you know, things happen. We do have sin. We have original sin, personal sin, social structures of sin. Yeah. But God's the one in charge. So... Yeah, you look. That's, uh, you know, that's interesting. People do um, they become affected by the, you know, the vicissitudes of their lives, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they become, um, you know, they often become bitter and twisted about something that's happened to them. And uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately, it often ha- often happens in the context of their religious beliefs, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know they. Uh, People take it out on the church. The church yeah. in Australia, the church in Australia, for example, has suffered enormously as a result of um, the child sex abuse scandal. And sure. uh, you know, we had a royal commission here, which found that sixty-two percent, sixty-two percent of the complaints to the uh, royal commission were uh, related to incidents involving Catholics. Yeah. Um, and you know, Catholics are, you know, less than half of that of the population. So. You know, it's because we have so many Catholic institutions and, uh, you know, so the whole question of religion in Australia has become undermined by this abuse scandal. And, you know, I, I for one, wish that the church would uh, take a much broader view of, um, of, of priestly life and the life of religious people uh, and somehow uh, recognise the importance of of there being further representation and greater identity between the rest of us, the census fidelium, mm-hmm. and the and the religious people, uh, mm-hmm. the clergy and the nuns and priests and brothers. Mm-hmm. And I think until that happens, until you know, Pope Francis obviously wants to address that, but I don't know that he's got the support of the bishops' conference to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if he could address it in uh, even in some small way, as they tried to do in South America. Mm-hmm. By allowing married priests, for example, um, to fill the void that's that now operates in lots of countries because yeah. they're not priests. You know, we have this. We have the big problem in Australia. The priests are all, by and large, 
getting on in years. Um, mm -hmm. And they're being replaced by priests from uh, Africa and India and South mm -hmm. America. And, and you know, the, these people are good people. They're holy people. But their culture is totally unrelated to the culture yeah. that, we live in, that we live in and that we're accustomed to. And so we find it difficult to, mm -hmm. you know, to practice our faith in the same way that we used to when we, you know, when we're all part of a much more homogenous group. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know how the church is going to address that, but, you know, it's catastrophic the number of people that, uh, that now don't go to church. I can remember, you know, 50 years ago, you couldn't get a seat in church. Uh, today, our churches are empty. Um, yeah. You know, even on important celebration occasions like Christmas and Easter, um, you can always get a seat. <laughs> you can mm -hmm. never stand outside the church in the old days. And right. so... You know, the number of people attending church has fallen off a cliff and and the church doesn't seem to be addressing it. You know, I know that the current synod is looking at all the right questions, but, you know, the bishops, the bishops don't allow a contribution by others who have sort of more first-hand experience, you know, at the coalface, so to speak. And I think until that happens um, mm -hmm. and until the church is prepared to give some ground on the issues that people at the coalface are raising, uh, then I think that we're going to be in this, we're going to be stuck in this mud with the church. I don't know when it's going to end, but... Um, it will. Uh, it will end at some point. Well, it will end. You know, we've had greater crises in the church, actually. Of course. I know people don't like to hear you say that, but we have had greater crises and we resolved them or God resolved them. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we do need God getting involved now more than ever. Mm -hmm. or at least directing us more than ever or, you know, pointing out the way as, as was done with Abraham and the prophets. You know, if we could get that back, that would help us enormously. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did in my book. You know, I, I explored the possibility that Mary's apparitions at Majigoria are the sign of our times that we're looking for and that what's being revealed um, at Majigoria is the ultimate intervention by God that we're looking for and that we're seeking to get out of our malaise. Um, and I could be wrong about that, of course, but it's, uh, it, it's something that seems to me has withstood the test of time. You know, for 40 years, yeah. that phenomenon has continued and uh, the secrets that have been given to the children are consistent with secrets that, our Lady gave it Lords and Fatima. Mm -hmm. um, um, and for those secrets to reveal um, God's take on things and God's determination about the direction in, we, in which we need to go um, needs to be really obvious, as Pope Benedict said. You know, it needs to be um, God intervening in a way that um, is not, not controversial. You know, this is. This, this needs to be uh, needs to be what we it, it, that's the light on the hill that we need um, for God to intervene in an uncontroversial and and maybe spectacular way, but in a way that uh, everyone recognises. Um, and it's kind of a cry for help, really, from the world. And whether God answers the cry or not um, is kind of you know our existence really depends on it in a way if if you believe what I believe about the state of the natural environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So have I run out of things to say? Have you run out of questions to ask me? <laughs> well, I think this has been fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think back. I don't think I've had uh, anyone else that I've interviewed that, uh, that really talked about the environment. Um, I'm it's really sure I'm right. It's really important to Pope Francis, and um, his, oh, uh, yeah. his encyclical Laudato Si is just a spectacular document. Yes, I agree. Uh, and um, yeah. I use know, it in my Catholic social teaching class. If half the things that um, he suggested were implemented, then um, we'd be well on the way to solving the problem that we've got. But uh, it is such a big problem, and. Um, the people have to be on side and I don't think the people are going to be on side unless 
God intervenes in some spectacular way. I mean, and I think that's what's happening at Majigora. But mm -hmm. you know, I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time that I've been wrong, Cynthia. Unfortunately, I'm often wrong, uh, but never doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't know how God acts. You know how He'll act, but um, I'm sure He didn't uh, create this beautiful universe and this beautiful planet just to ignore it when it was in trouble. No. Yeah. Well, I, agree. I, I agree with that 100%. And yeah. uh, if, ever, if ever we needed his help, it's now because, um, you know, the signs are all terrible. You mm -hmm. know, the signs of the, of the state of the oceans and, um, you know, the melting of the ice caps and the melting. You know, Greenland is two miles thick of ice. If, that, if all that ice goes into the ocean, oh, the ocean's going to be seven That's not going to be good. Vermont yes. is going to be underwater. Seven metres high. pretty far inland. Else and goes yeah. into the ocean. Yeah. Uh, you know, these are, these are huge problems, existential problems. And, um, you know, we all need to address them. And uh, it's just not going to be good enough if, um, if, if people with influence and power say it's all rubbish and say that, uh, you know, it's just a figment of our imagination. Yeah. It's a, it's a serious problem that has to be addressed, and if it's not addressed, the consequences are dire. And even, you know, the precautionary principle demands that, you know, if you think there's a disaster coming, you should take steps to avert it. Mm -hmm. We have a, the disaster called COVID, and people don't even want to divert that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know people, we had here in town, there was a man who did not believe that there was COVID. He thought it was a hoax. Yeah. He was a cab driver. <laughs> He was a cab driver. So anytime he wouldn't wear a mask, didn't get vaccinated. Anytime he took anyone anywhere in the cab, he said, you can't wear a mask in my cab. Wow. And he just, uh, he just died of COVID. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, the thing is, you know, um, people are slow to learn. Yeah, yeah. I, th I mean, there's no doubt that COVID cost uh, Donald Trump the presidency. Um, he was he was he was part of the conspiracy that it wasn't real and that we don't need to worry about it and we just get on with our lives and never mind all the people that it kills. I mean, I mean um, the same thing happened uh, in other countries, you know, where it wasn't addressed and it just got completely out of hand and the, and the death toll has been horrendous. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, people seem to have learned and um, you know, fortunately enough, people are now vaccinated. Yeah. So that the effect of even the ver certainly the variants that we're familiar with mm -hmm. um, are not going to be as destructive as they mm -hmm. were in the past. So, you know, hopefully we've got a, you know, we've got light at the end of the tunnel on COVID, mm -hmm. um, but um, we haven't got light at the end of the tunnel on the environmental problems. And until we address those in the same way that we've addressed the COVID problem, um, we have a problem that uh, could easily get out of hand. And, I think we've only got a short time to do it. You know, the mm -hmm. universal or the, the consensus in the scientific community seems to be that we really have only this decade to address the problems. Otherwise, they have a life and an exponential growth of their own that we can't deal with once we, um, you know, once we let, let them develop to a point, such as, you know, glacial ice melts and mm -hmm. uh, sea level rises and that sort of thing. But... You know, the politics is difficult and I don't know how it's going to be resolved, but divine intervention would greatly assist us. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> well, well I've, uh, I've had a great time during this interview. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, our listeners and those who watch the podcast will uh, agree. Well, it's uh, all, all the all the things that I've said, controversial though they may be, are in my book, and uh, it mm -hmm. does have a Neil Obstat. So um, mm -hmm. we we haven't touched on a lot of difficult issues in the church, and I think it's good in a way that we haven't, because uh, my book covers things like conscience, the primacy of conscience, and covers in great detail the abortion issue, which is so divisive, um, and. My view about those things um, is as a human rights lawyer and so not necessarily as someone who would be seen by the church as representative of 
the faithful, um, but it's a secular view and and uh, the secular world uh, mostly is the Catholic population, you know, the religious people and the nuns and priests um, are not in the majority. Um, so they have to listen to the faithful because we all need to be on the same page. Yeah. We have to be guided by the religious people and the, and the clergy, but on the other hand, they have to recognise that we have certain views about the world and how it's going and where it's going. And mm -hmm. um, fortunately, we have a Pope like Francis who takes those things on board. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the next thing for the Holy Father to do is to act upon them. Mm. Once that happens, I think things will begin to improve. All in the right time. Good. Well, thank you very much, Cynthia, for okay. talking with me. I'm very oh, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, looking forward to getting back to you again um, when the book's been around the traps and mm -hmm. we'll see how it goes and see what sort of responses it's had. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully there'll be something that we can talk about on, um, on WCAT radio without getting into too much trouble. <laughs> oh, anyway, okay, would you, you like? Much. Sure, I enjoyed it. Would you like Good. to close us with a prayer? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, have mercy on us. Uh, understand our difficulties, and with your grace, we can make the proper decisions that we need to make to avert our troubles and the destination that we and the trajectory that we seem to be on. Um, we ask for your guidance and for your illumination in the way that you eliminated the prophets of old, Abraham and the others, uh, illuminate us so that we make the right decisions and go down the path that you would have us follow. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you again very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Nice okay. to speak with you. Same here. Have a good night. Bye -bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Or I guess a good day. <laughs> good day. Yes, indeed. Yes, I'm just starting. <laughs> I'm just getting yeah, started. Yeah. yeah, it's late here. <laughs> Take okay. care. Bye-bye.